in our last discussion, we were in the, the first verse of Hebrews 12, and um, we spent the time t- um, talking about the uh, being compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses. So tonight we move on to the uh, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which does so easily beset us and let us run with patience the race that is set um, before us. It um, reference to laying aside every weight. Um, one of my translations gives us strip, strip off. It's actually the same word as translated laid down in Acts 7 verse 58 in relation to laying down clothes, which is fairly relevant um, to this particular um, text because the fact that Paul goes on to say, let us run with, uh, let us run with patience the race, indicates he's drawing an analogy here between the, the natural and the spiritual athlete. Not that this is the only time he ever does that. There are other places um, as well. And, uh, of course, it's pretty basic that with a natural athlete, especially when it comes to running a race, they don't run a race wearing a long robe or a heavy overcoat or gumboots. You imagine, imagine having an Olympics scene of them getting ready to run whatever the marathon, maybe the marathon would be the appropriate, the appropriate race, and, you get, and then you see a guy out there wearing gum boots and a long overcoat, you'd think that's a joke, that's a joke. Yeah, um, yeah. and of course, um, clothing for a runner, clothing hinders, it, um, it impedes progress. So obviously a runner has to um, lay his clothes aside, strips them, he has to strip them off, and he has to be as lightly attired as he um, possibly can. And uh, just sort of thinking of the, of the analogy, it is the same in the, in the spiritual. You know, even, even people of the world who observe people who claim to be Christians, people who claim to have entered the race to eternal life, and when they observe that they are cluttered with worldly, carnal, ungodly attitudes, which is tantamount to wearing a long, heavy overcoat and gumboots and trying to run a race, you know, with, with freedom. We know that they would have the same scoffing scepticism um, towards such a, a person who claims to be a Christian as, as, as we would if we saw a runner entering the marathon um, encumbered with, um, with all this uh, um, attire. It's, um, it, is, it is that basic, mm. you know, it is that basic. And it is that much of a violation of the Christian calling and the Christian commitment to be encumbered with worldly, carnal, ungodly attitudes which um, can only have a weighing down effect and which can very badly um, have a detrimental effect on, uh, on our race for eternal life. In relation to this, the diaglot renders the words sin which does so easily beset us as close girding sin, making it clear um, that an analogy is being um, presented here. And so the same Greek word translated lay aside is also translated lay apart and laying aside in relation to filthiness of the flesh and malice in James 1 verse 21 and in 1 Peter 2 um, verse 1. It's also translated, the same Greek is translated cast off, put off and putting away in relation to darkness, deceitful lusts, and lying. Um, I won't give you the quotes, but, but if anybody's interested, they can, still, they can still find them. So, you know, what I'm saying is that, that darkness, that is ignorance, um, ignorance of the way of God, 
and wanting to remain ignorant of the way of God and deceitful, deceitful lusts. Um, I think deceitful lusts means lusts that one feels or one justifies oneself. That's the deceit. That's the deceit of sin where it justifies. Um, it justifies lusts. And that's why it's called deceitful, deceitful lust and lying. Those are the three things mentioned there. Darkness, deceitful lust and lying. And we're told to cast off, put off, put them, put them away. Um, which is all part of the analogy um, of the, the runner stripping himself off of that which would, in, which would in, uh, encumber him because these are the things, and of course there are others mentioned elsewhere in the word, these are the things that hinder progress, the things that can hold a person back in the race and uh, to attempt the race with those carnal, um, ungodly attitudes clinging to us would be like a, a runner trying to, to run mm. um, with, with gum boots and an overcoat yeah. and a heavy helmet. Yeah. <laughs> um, I've actually brought with me a bulletin um, in which Brian um, related to this. I don't know how many of you read the bulletins, but I thought I'd like to like to read it just in case you didn't read it. Um, it's, in, it's a something to chew on. <clears throat> Did you know that an aircraft gains weight as it gets older? Well, neither did I recently, but apparently it's true. Inside the metal body of each and every MD-80, 737 or A320, there lies a set of insulation blankets to isolate the plane's contents from those excruciatingly cold temperatures 30,000 feet up. As the plane takes off, these blankets absorb moisture and weight, which they do not fully release upon landing. It's true that airlines are keen to operate new fleets of planes because newer engines and designs are more fuel efficient. But that is not the only reason. The additional weight that a plane's insulation blankets absorb through the years takes a considerable toll on operational costs with fuel at its current high price. There's no wonder the airlines charge so much for baggage over the weight allowance. The phenomenon of gaining weight with age is, of course, not one which is confined to aeroplanes. Come the 30s and beyond, even the thinnest men usually experience belt size creep. <laughs> and some, some find keeping weight down more difficult than others. This becomes a major preoccupation for many, both for reasons of health and aesthetics. And where human beings are concerned, it seems to be a phenomenon not just within the body, but around it too. I'm speaking of the problem of clutter. Some may shift house after a few years of being in the same location. They hire a large skip, and when it arrives, gaze into its cavernous mouth, certain that it could never be filled. Mm -hmm. Of course, it does. Mm -hmm. A year or so later, they move again. And it's remarkable how much stuff there is again to throw away. Mm -hmm. We have no idea where it comes from. It just seems to assemble itself and somehow attach itself to <laughs> us. Now, if this is going on in the external physical world, in which we live, and we know that this isn't something unique to us. We have been in too many other people's garages, sheds, and basements for that. Then perhaps there may be an analogy with what can tend to happen in the spiritual. And of course, there is. The writer of the Hebrews makes the point explicit when he exhorts us to lay aside every sin and weight. Hebrews 12 verse 1. These things beset us so easily, he tells us. Certainly this is true in the world of physical things in the West, where the measures measured in our waistline or personal clutter, so it, it is no real surprise it might be true in spiritual things also. But how is it true? The analogy itself offers some help. 
People gain weight as they age, in part because they don't exercise or work as hard physically as they used to. For that, we would want to compare our level of commitment and involvement in God and church-centred activities with that which we might have had when we were younger. Has there been any temptation to say, soul, take thine ease as far as spiritual exercise and discipline is concerned? Or again, thinking of the issue of obesity, have we become careless about our spiritual intake? Our minds are not garbage bins for the world's trash. Our bodies are meant to be temples for God. And we start that process by having our minds and hearts in the right place. We know there have been things that we have been horrified and appalled by when we were younger. We can smile and forgive ourselves, saying, but we were so naive and narrow-minded back then. Or we can examine ourselves more seriously, knowing that whereas our standards have clearly changed in some respects, God's standards have not. So we had better sort out in our own consciences what is really right and what is due to sloppiness and lethargy. And what about the accumulation of things that are not so easily released, whether it be moisture in an aeroplane, which adds weight and burns more fuel, or whether it be physical clutter, which is a mass and needs to be sorted, organised, dusted, perhaps, and ultimately probably discarded. Perhaps here, spiritual challenge would be pruning and prioritising. Do we have the time and energy to pursue all the interests we might theoretically like to pursue when we are compelled to respond to the love and call of Christ? Are we clogging up our life with dreams and fancies that, while they seem appealing, are only hampering us from the life we really want to lead before God. What emotional baggage, like resentments, petty strifes, attitudes, are we carrying with us which are serving no positive good in the Lord's service? What other worldly baggage might we have absorbed in terms of mindsets, attitudes and aspirations which may be pulling us away from the light of the kingdom? In the face of these weights, each one easier to pick up than to put down, the letter to the Hebrews is clear and uncompromising. It says, lay it aside and run the race. Good. It was a good article, eh? Yeah. Mm. I, don't know, I don't know where he got it from, but um, it was good. And uh, I earmarked it for our Hebrews chapter 12, verse 1. Mm. Mm. Barry, do you think um, when it says, let us lay aside every weight, and the sin that um, a distinction is being made between the things which are sins and the things which can be weights. In other words, they're not necessarily a sin, but there's still a weight that, that would um, hinder us. Or do you think weight and sin are actually synonymous in that? Scripture? No, I, I, I do agree. I, I think it's referring to Two, two separate issues. You see, it doesn't say every weight, the sin that easily besets us, right. as if to say the weight is the sin. Hmm. It says weight and yeah. sin. So two different things are here because not, not all weights are actually sin. Yeah. Um, I mean, sin we know is transgression of God's law. It's a violation um, of God's will, of God's word. But a weight... Is, can sometimes be something that's actually harmless in itself or even legitimate, but a hindrance yeah. and an impediment to our spiritual progress. The, the Revised Standard Version translates weight as hindrance. And uh, I notice the dialogue gives encumbrance mm. and uh, strong, as you say, it's a burden, a burden, a burden something yeah. you're carrying that's, that's heavy. Uh, um, and, and that is a, it's a load. So, and of course, each believer has to decide if there are weights yeah. in their life that are weighing them down, that are actually hindering 
may not be completely stopping, oh. but that you're actually that are hindering spiritual um, progress and holding holding them back. I mean, there can be so easily in a Christian's life um, unnecessary commitments, unnecessary preoccupations, unnecessary involvements, unnecessary burdens. Sometimes carrying burdens you don't need to carry. Mm. They're not really yours even to carry. Yeah. And they can be holding you back. And being they're a, they're, a, they're a weight. Sometimes it might be out of the goodness of our heart that we commit ourselves to a burden, but it's actually detrimentally affecting yeah. our, our walk before the Lord or our service before the Lord. And sometimes we, we have to um, um, evade. Mm. You, know, you can you know, relate that, Barry. To the thorns and the thistles, yeah. And, and, uh, and when Jesus was talking about what what is hindering people um, in, in the Lord, um, and the thorns and the thistles are the cares and and the things that are happening in the world, mm. um, and much of what you've just said encompasses a lot of that. Mm. Uh, <clears throat> I was talking um, a particular brother who um, for many years in his life spent a lot of time on PlayStation and was actually very, very addicted um, to it. And during his initial conversion, during his initial being you know, set on fire for the Lord, he was still, he was still clinging um, to that. I don't mean by that that he wasn't into the word and wasn't coming to meetings. He was doing that. Um, but also there was a lot of time being spent and, uh, on PlayStation. And um, he came to the place without anybody telling him mm. it was uh, the work of God, it was the work of the Spirit, where he just came under conviction and realised how much more progress he could make if he spent that time um, in the word yeah. or in prayer mm. uh, or in, you know, in, in, spirit, in spiritual things. And uh, so, yeah, it was a, um, it was a, it was a sort of a, a weight yeah. that was sort of weighing him down yeah. and preventing him from running as well. Yeah. Um, it's not that he wasn't running, yeah. but that he could run better, yeah, you right. know, and, and, uh, and that, is the, that is the thing. And there can be... There can be things in our life that don't need to be there that may give the flesh pleasure, but they, they're a hindrance and that we would, uh, we would do better. There are better things we could do in the time that we're spending in those things, you know what I mean? And uh, I always find, I find that in, in anything to do in life as far as commitments are concerned, the rule I work by, I say, can I imagine Jesus doing this? You know? Um, okay, there are some things we do because of the, the time we're living in and the, and the modern age we're living in that Jesus wouldn't have done because he didn't have access. <laughs> he didn't have access to them in the, in the first place. Um, but it, it generally is, uh, it generally is a, a good rule um, to work by. And of course... The, the, the answer you come to, the conclusion you come to, will determine very much on the, on the level you are at in Jesus. You know, there are all different levels in mm. Jesus. Some people are on a very low level, got a long way to go. Others are a bit higher up, but high. the higher the level you go in Jesus, the more you tend to be conformed to him or more conformed to his, um, his attitude. Mm. I'm, I'm, yeah, I'm glad, Barry, that you made a distinction between the weight and the, and the sin, because that's the way it, it would read to me. Yeah. And so I was thinking, you know, you've, you've given a couple of examples there, but I was thinking, I, I'm trying to think of another example of a weight or a burden that would be sort of weighing down a Christian that wasn't necessarily a sin, but, but still a weight or a burden, as you said. Mm. And I know statistically, and I even remember when I grew up in a Presbyterian church and our minister who you know, had a lot of, was doing a lot of work in the church, you know, preaching every week and whatever, but his son was the most rebellious kid in the church. Mm. And I know statistically, you know, a lot of ministers in churches, they are spending so much time, 
you know, working for the church and, and it's, it's usually, you know, not a body ministry like we have. So mm. therefore, they've got a lot of responsibility. And you would say, well, that's not a sin, right? Mm. Preparing talks to talk about God and serving the church. It's not a sin, but it becomes a weight. It becomes a hindrance mm. when it's affecting their family. Mm. Mm. So I thought, well, that was maybe another good example of how something can be a weight right. or a hindrance mm. where you wouldn't look at it and go, it's a sin. But actually, you know, the minister that, that I knew and, and others need to actually take a look and go, you know what? Um, yes, it's great to work for God, but if my family is suffering, and, and like the Bible says, if you don't minister to your own family, you're worse than an infidel, yeah. then, and maybe the church should be helping me, you know, share talks or, or whatever it needed to be, um, to actually allow me to, to spend the time with my family. So I thought that was another example. Right. Uh, I was interested as well, that word weight. Um, we've talked about it before, and it, this one jumps out as another example as far as, as far as I can see, the only time that the Greek word, which is onkos, is used in the whole of the New Testament is here. Um, and as we discussed another time, you know, that obviously jumps out, the fact that the writer has only ch chosen one place to use a particular word. There's other places in the New Testament where it talks about weight, but it doesn't use this, this Greek word, so it's unique. And it literally it comes from a root word um, which, which means basically um, a bent or a curved arm. And so the comparison of this weight is being like, it's so heavy, it is causing you to bend or bulge because of its load. You know, like mm. you have a bent arm, right. it's causing you to bend and bulge like a bent arm. And that's a pretty heavy weight, isn't it? Mm. Like you think, oh mm. yeah, I put my backpack on, it's got a few kilos, it doesn't make me bend. I can even put a big tramping pack on, it can be 20 mm. kilos. That doesn't make me bend because my back's good, um, if it is good. But this is talking about a weight which is so heavy, it's causing you to actually bend because of its load. Mm. And you know that's quite a, a good picture, isn't it, of, of what we're trying to discover here is those things that would do that, such a weight that causes that much effect mm. on your spiritual life, causing your spirituality to not necessarily break, but to bend. Mm. Mm. Yeah. I remember years ago being told um, about a Christian who was committed to all sorts of committees mm. to do, which were worldly clubs. And, and yeah, it was quite surprising the number of committees that he was committed to, none of which encouraged or enhanced spirituality mm. uh, at all, and mostly involved worldly people, you know, yeah. but it was such a burden. And, and they ended up missing meetings, yeah. you know, not being here to, with God's people to praise the Lord and because of these other commitments, and it was like a weight. Um, what, like a weight in his life that, um, that held him back from being where he otherwise would be and preventing him from doing what he otherwise would have been doing in the, you know, in the Lord. Mm. So, um, yeah, there are several different angles yep. from which you, look, you can look at the, uh, at the, the weight. I, I wonder also, you know, he said, laying aside every weight and not the sins... Not the sins, plural, but he says the, um, the sin, um, which implies or can easily apply that he could have in mind us of a specific sin, mm. of there being a specific sin, not sins um, in general, a sin in particular which easily um, besets us. I mean, there are all sorts of sins that don't easily beset us, but I think it would be fair to say for most Christians, there's usually one. <laughs> there's usually one. There's usually a weak spot <coughs> somewhere um, where a particular sin is a person's weakness, and uh, and the, you know they, they have a, a, a difficulty um, dealing dealing with it. And um, this uh, that bes besets us, I mean, it, it's cling, it's a clinger, it's a clinger, and, a, and it easily takes control. Uh, it might relate to a particular weakness 
that a person finds difficult to crucify and which very easily controls them. I mean, it might be pride, mm. it might be envy, it might be lust, it might be grudges, it might be resentment, it might be anger, it might be bad temper, it might be love for money, uh, it might be an unforgiving spirit. You know, there are so many things that mm. you could easily pick out just one uh, where it might be a particular weakness and, and, a, and a particular recurring sin in a person's life that, that, they are, um, that they are dealing with. But it just struck me that it's the sin singular, not, the, not sins, the sin which does so easily um, um, beset us. That word, or those words, sin which does so easily beset us, actually come from one Greek word, uperistatos, if that's pronounced correctly. It's the only time. It's the only time it occurs in the New Testament. And Strong says it means standing around a competitor, thwarting a racer in every direction. Mm -hmm. And Thayer, Thayer's lexicon, he says it means skillfully surrounding, that is besetting, to prevent or to retard running. And here again, I think Paul is using the analogy of a runner in a race as like in the Greek Olympics where someone um, surrounds or stands in the way um, of a runner trying to hinder you know, his progress, trying to thwart his progress to prevent him from obtaining the crown. I know I've seen on, on TV sometimes with cycling races how that um, sometimes some idiot mm. tries to hinder uh, a cyclist and some, e some even are stupid enough to walk out mm. you know, in, fr in front of them mm. and they, sometimes they crash into them and fall off or they have to take a dangerous manoeuvre mm. and end up crashing into other bikes or, or something. And, um, and so it's not hard to believe that back in the, in the, in the New Testament times yeah. in the Olympics that, you know, that, that sort of thing because they, 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 they didn't have this, the same measure of protection um, for the competitors as, as what they do um, to, uh, today. But in the spiritual dimension um, involving our race for eternal life, we know that um, hindrances can occur by people. People, I mean, it, it can be close family members. Um, it could be work colleagues. It could be neighbours. It could be old friends. People can get in the way. People can get in the way of our, of our spiritual progress, not necessarily <coughs> deliberately, but sometimes with families that are really anti-Christ, anti it can be done quite um, deliberately. Worldly-minded people who are not spiritual and who would um, try and discourage you from being spiritual and uh, that's how I would relate that, the, you know, the natural into the, um, the, the spiritual. Romans 16 verse 17 says to keep an eye out for those who create obstacles and avoid them. Um, we know there is a saying, bad company corrupts good morals. And we need to be wise in the company that we select or the friends that we get close to because they can have an undermining and, uh, and a discouraging effect and hinder, hinder our race for eternal life. Proverbs 4, verse 14 to 15 says, Head not in the direction of the wicked and don't go down their path. Avoid it. Do not pass in that direction. Turn from it and pass away. It's quite a theme, isn't it, in the, in the book. Of, um, of Proverbs. And of course, unfortunately, some of the, the Hebrew Christians, the Jewish Christians, had failed to, um, to do this. They had allowed the Judaizers to create obstacles. They allowed the Judaizers to get to them with the law and the, and the ordinances of, of the law. And that became a, a, an obstacle it became a, an, an impediment preventing them from continuing the race for eternal life, which has Jesus 
as the, uh, the goal. Mm. And uh, as we know from what we've seen, um, obviously a, a number of them were turning back um, from the race and going back into the, uh, the law. Sam, one's quite interesting in relation to um, choosing our friends carefully, where, it's, where he says, Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the ungodly, um, nor stands in the path of sinners, nor sits in the seat of the scornful, but his delight is in the law of the Lord. Mm. So we need to be at a, at a, a state in our lives to recognise the people that we are mixing with and who we want to be our friends. Right. Um, because as we know, you choose the wrong friends, you'll end up being like them. Mm. But if you choose the right friends, as we have chosen, um, yeah, you'll remain uh, in the Lord. Mm. It's interesting, Barry, you pointing out there that that phrase, let us lay aside every weight based on one word, and again, the only time it's used in the New Testament. So mm. we're getting, getting quite a, a sort of a, a, I liken it to a, a meal, you know, where you get a, a nice spread of food and there's something unique. You know, it's like the chef has created something new in the food or it's a food from another country you never had before. It's like a unique serving. Right. So that's what we're getting tonight, just in mm. two words actually together. Mm. And it's, you know, you would know more than any of us, Barry, there are other examples which we've mm. discussed in the past, but it's not that common that a, a Greek word is only used once in the whole whole Bible, is no. it? So we've got two in quick succession, mm. which is even <clears throat> even more of a, a, a red flag to say, hey, stand up and take notice. I mm. noticed, Barry, when you were describing the, the meaning of the word, I think it was, was it Thayer's where you said it meant a skillful, a skillful um, surrounding or thwarting of a competitor. And that, that holds true because um, that phrase made up of one word, it's, it's made up of several sort of Greek words together, and part of it actually means good or well done, which obviously refers to the, the skillful part. And I was thinking about that, the sin which so easily besets us. In other words, it's a skillful thwarter of us. Mm. That describes perfectly the, the serpent, doesn't it? Mm. Yeah. He was more cunning. Mm. He wasn't an idiot. He wasn't stupid. He wasn't a fool. The cunning the, the serpent was cunning. Right. And Paul makes that point, doesn't he, in Second Corinthians, where he says, you know, I don't want you to be deceived, you know, by the the, the cunningness. Obviously there's not a snake tempting us, literally now. The snake mm. has become a symbol for sin, which is cause, which dwells in us. Mm. But we need to realise, we need to be aware, we need to be astute ourselves. Yeah, the sin in us, it's cunning. Mm -hmm. It's clever. It's skillful. Mm -hmm. It's not stupid. And so therefore, it's going to find every which way. And yeah, this is, this is, I think, no better exemplified than when you see mature Christians and you think, All right, mature Christian, they've Man, they've fought the flesh for so many years. They've got such a really mature Bible knowledge now. There is no way that a temptation you know, would even get on top of them mm. anymore. They're, they're just so skillful. But it does, doesn't it? Mm. Even though you be a mature Christian, know the word well, you can still sin. You can, right. still, you can still trip up. Mm. And even Jesus, okay, he didn't trip up. But he was still able, able to be seriously tempted mm. to the point where he was sweating as if great drops of blood, mm. you know, praying to God, you know, please let this cup pass from me. Mm. Now, if it wasn't a temptation, mm. why did he bother, you know, asking and why was he in so much turmoil? Right. The fact yeah. is, even yeah. though with his knowledge, his maturity, mm. the flesh was still so cunning yeah. that it was able to quote scripture. Mm. You know, like it did, you know, yeah. to quote scripture to him and, and tempt him. So, you know, we, we know this because we understand what, what the devil is, our sin in the flesh. We know what we're up against. But, you know, some Christians, I don't think, really appreciate how skillful and cunning our flesh really is. And mm. when you come to know that, you've got to do something about that. You've got to counter that cunning, 
skillful attack with what? A cunning and a skillful offense. Mm, right. And that's why the Bible says, hey, you know, we are rightfully dividing the word of truth. Mm. We've got to be skillful in our appreciation mm. of the word of God and our counterattack. Mm. Right? Mm. Mm. The heart is deceitful yes. above all things. Right. Yeah. You know, and desperately wicked. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. You talk about you know, sin being clever and cunning and deceitful. I think it would be fair to say that the cleverer our brain gets, <laughs> the cleverer sin gets. That's right. Yeah, yeah. Because it's sin is using the brain. Yeah. You know, and, and that's why I always maintain that Jesus would have had um, far greater scope yeah. for temptation because he was clever. Mm. He had a very lively brain. And uh, the, more, uh, the more of that brain matter there is, the more sin has got to work with, right. yeah. you know. Exactly. And, uh, yeah. so, but he, uh, he dealt with it. Yeah. He, um, he, got on, he got on top of it all right. Yeah. Yeah. So, I, think, I think most of us that have had children, especially if we've had a couple of boys, um, is Greg listening? <laughs> um, we would recognise that quite often the smarter one was the one with, who could come up with the cleverest ways of getting more. Out. The more cunning. The cleverer not, you are, the more cunning. I'm not telling you yeah. which one, of course. <laughs> I'm sure we can all identify. We can all identify with it. Yeah. Yeah, because, you see, God has created us with, the, uh, with potential to be cunning. Mm. And Jesus said, you know, be cunning as serpents. That's right. Well, wise, he said, but yeah. you, know, you can use the word cunning there. Be cunning as serpents. <laughs> um, it's, it's important to be able to be cunning, mm. but, but in, a, in a good way, you know, in a God-honouring way. Uh, but, of course, that, that doesn't mean that sin can't use it in a bad way. Yeah. Um, yeah, it's a, it's a seesaw, right. this you know, Jekyll and Hyde mm. um, thing scenario. Yeah. I was thinking before we're talking about the being too clever, it's almost like a, a lawyer who is actually using the loopholes in the law mm. to get out of something without actually breaking the law, right? Even though mm. what happened is actually wrong, because he's so clever with the law, mm. yeah, he can break it, mm. but not break it. Yeah, yeah. Get yeah. The off. yeah. We could do that to ourselves, can't we, Val? Yes. Our yep. imaginations. Mm. In looking at this word run, the metaphor um, run, it's interesting. I don't know if any of you have ever thought about it, but there are actually four, four different metaphors used in the Bible to describe our involvement in the Lord. And they uh, sit, stand, walk, and run. <laughs> and the, these words are all used in, a, in a, a spiritual sense, you know. We are sitting in heavenly places, mm. you know, in Christ Jesus. We walk with God. We walk by faith. Mm. That's biblical. We stand fast in the faith. We stand fast in the Lord. And of course, as we see here, we run with patience the race that is set before us. But ultimately, there's a fourth. We're going to fly. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that's right. Isaiah 40, rise up like eagles. Yeah. And, um, yeah. and that uh, I, the, what brought that to my mind was years and years ago, a neighbour of ours, a Pentecostal couple, we had a lot to do with, and they passed on um, some literature, some books from time to time. And they were very fond um, of an author whose name was Watchman Nee. And um, they, they lent us this booklet which was entitled Sit, Walk and Stand. Right. And the book was devoted to, you know, to those things and drawing out the um, the spiritual lessons yeah. um, from them, yeah. which was quite um, quite clever. Yeah. yeah, something I'd never ever thought of, yeah. and probably even to this day mm. would never have actually thought of you know sort of putting those thoughts together yeah. um, like that. But mm. um, 
quite a, you know, quite a, I mean, quite a, a, a Sunday morning meeting, you know, could be given um, by just looking up those words and see how they're used, mm. and it would make quite a good, it would make quite a good um, theme. So do you think, Barry, like, if, if we were to want to write that scripture without inspiration, that it would be counterintuitive to say, let us run with patience? Don't, don't you think we would choose to put, let us sit, let us sit calmly, or maybe, maybe walk, like you're just walking contemplatively, just carefully, slowly, with patience, you see, goes yeah. together. Running with patience <laughs> doesn't sort of go together, does it? But obviously yeah. we can take a spiritual lesson from it, mm. one of which is, hey, patience, although we would like to think of it probably as just sitting doing nothing, mm. is actually something you've got to be swift at, at doing. It's mm. got to be an active thing. I think endurance, <clears throat> which is used in some, in my modern King James here, they use the word endurance rather than patience, which I think yeah, yeah. hits the nail on the head. Right. Um, because patience can have lots of connotations yeah. in, mm. in all sorts of various words. Endurance, hanging in there. And the word run doesn't necessarily mean to run. It means to move quickly. Mm. And it can mean walking quickly. Diligence. Yeah. Mm. So, yeah. Um, and if you're running a, race, a long race, you're not going to run flat out. In fact, if you're an old fella, you might be doing a fair bit of walking. Mm. But yeah, yeah, yeah but it's because it's because he's using the analogy of a race that he has to use the word run, yeah. because you don't walk a race. Mm. <laughs> um, but um, but I think you're right, you're right, John. The, the the emphasis is to run is to. Um, is to not be slack or slothful or yeah. Yeah. slovenly, yeah. you know, in our walk or in our race. And of course, if 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 Paul has in mind a race such as the as the marathon, um, which I'm sure he would, because it would not be fitting to be likening our race for eternal life to a hundred meter dash. Yeah. Um, it's a lot. It's a long haul, yeah. longer for some than others. Um, and 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 so, it does need patience because, the, you know, those who run in the marathon they get tired, mm. you know, they they do get tired, and uh, it's easy to get tired uh, when you've been waiting for the Lord for decade after decade after decade, and uh, and you have certain expectations and it doesn't happen, you know, and it, it would be easy if you were weak, to get discouraged, to get dispirited. And uh, that's what happens when you are not patient. Mm. Uh, you've got it, patience hangs in there. It, it doesn't give in and it doesn't give up. Mm. Um, remember that Evie song? Never give up and never give in. <sighs> we saw an example of that sort of thing when we went to our um, granddaughter's sports the other day. They had a, um, what do they call it, cross country race. And some of the kids, when they start out, yeah. they went flat out. Yeah. They yeah. The word go, but they didn't finish. Yeah. So I guess if you're patient, you take time yourself yeah. mm. so that you make the end. Yeah. Right. Mm. It was quite funny to watch, actually. Yeah. Mm. yeah. And I think, um, sorry, Barry. It's all right. I was going to say, experience has a big part to play in that, doesn't it? Because yeah. when you're a young kid, you don't have a clue. You probably never even walked the course. If someone said, oh, it's a kilometre long, you go, how long's a kilometre? I don't have a clue. I just like running. Yeah. So you've got no experience. Mm. You just like running. And you think if you run the fastest, you get there. But of course, the older children, they've done the course before. They now appreciate a kilometre is this far. Mm, that's quite a while. Mm. So the experience allows them to be wiser in it, doesn't it? And right. a good spiritual lesson there as well. Yeah. You know, as we get more experienced in Christ, we should be able to sort of navigate this endurance better, shouldn't we? Mm. I've got a couple of scriptures, you'll all, be, you'll all be familiar with them, but in relation to what we've been talking about, 1 Corinthians 9, um, it's well known for its reference to running. Paul says, surely you know that many runners take part in a race, but only one of them 
wins the prize. Incidentally, you, you got to, when he talks only one gets a prize, obviously it doesn't mean there's only going to be one person <laughs> that's going to get eternal life. Yeah. The, the thing is, the, the one is the body of right. Christ. Yeah. Yeah, it's the body of Christ. Mm. Only one of them wins the prize. Run then in such a way as to win the prize. Every athlete in training submits to strict discipline in order to be crowned with a wreath that will not last or not, not wither and fade and die. But we do it for one that will last forever. That is why I run straight for the finishing line. That is why I'm no shadow boxer wasting my punches. I severely discipline my body and bring it into subjection, making it know its master in case I end up being a castaway, disqualified, even though I have preached to others. And uh, 1 Peter 4 is good. He says, You have spent enough time in the past doing what the heathen do. Your lives were spent in indecency, lust, drunkenness, orgies, drinking parties, and idolatry. But now they think it's weird that you do not still run with them mm. and join with them in the same wild and reckless living. And so they speak evil of you and insult you, but they will have to give an account of themselves to God. So there are a couple of good passages in mm. relation to that. So, uh, you know, it's obviously there are two different tracks on, uh, on which we can run. There's a narrow one and a, and, a, and a wide one. One leads to eternal life and the other one leads to eternal death. And uh, as in the case of those who run the marathon, um, it's a run all the way. Yeah, no stopping, um, not a jog, not a trot, no loitering, yeah. no lingering or slackening um, along the way. That's, that's what it's saying. Yeah. That is really the, the, the emphasis um, in, in there. I noticed um, that word race when it says run with patience. The race, um, it's used six times. The, the Greek word argon or agon in the New Testament and literally it means a contest and obviously in the context of the way Paul is using it um, translating it race is, is no problem mm. but all of the other times that it's actually um, uh, used and, and translated it's always translated twice conflict twice fight and the other time is contention so yes in context it's, it's a race but I think in the word we need to see it as more than just a, a race. It's also going to be a conflict. It's going to be a fight. Mm. And, of course, the, the things that we've already talked about tonight, especially based on the marathon, um, not only are you sort of contending against opposition runners, you're fighting, you're contending against your own body. Mm. You know, in a marathon, your body is going to be screaming out to you, stop, this is too much, are you hurt? You know, you want to be sick, you're, you're thirsty, you can't go on. But of course a marathon demands that, that strength, that, that fight that goes on in the brain where the athletes are saying to themselves, no, you can, just a little bit further, a little t to the next stop. And, and then we talked a bit, we talk about in, in athletics getting your second win. And often if you can just keep going, mm. the body adjusts, it gets used to the, the, the hardness Mm. And you do get, you know, extra energy and a second win. Right. So spiritually speaking, again, you know, we're under no illusions. It's a fight. Mm. It's, it's, it's going to be a contention. We're not a Christian thinking it's just a, a cakewalk through life. It's mm. going to be fighting. It's going to be swimming against the tide, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. When I, when I did the original study on the epistle to Hebrews, which was in the early, the early 1970s. Well, what, what, was I about <laughs> 50, around 50, about 40? Yeah. I was about 40 years old. Gee, those are the days. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I had several commentaries that, that I um, um, drew some good, you know, good stuff from. One of them was this one, The Way Into the Holiest by Meyer, F.B. Uh, Meyer. And there was just a little section here I thought I'd read in relation to what we've been 
talking about. He says, the idea of a race is generally competition. Here, it is only concentration of purpose, singleness of aim, intensity, Mm -hmm. life in earnest. That's the idea. But how far do we seem from it? And what a contrast there is between our earnestness in all beside and then our devotion to God and man. We are willing enough to join in the rush of business competition or in the race for wealth or in the heated discussion of politics or in social life or in the pursuit of pleasure. But ah, how soon we slacken when it becomes a question of how much are we willing to do for God? How earnest men are around us. Newton poring over his problems till the midnight wind sweeps over his pages, the ashes of his long extinguished fire. Reynolds sitting, brush in hand, before his canvas for 36 hours together, summoning into life forms of beauty that seemed glad to come. Dryden composing in a single fortnight his ode for St Celia's Day. Buffon dragged from his beloved slumbers to his more beloved studies. And the biographer who records these traits, himself rising with the dawn to prepare for the demands of his charge. In a world like this, and with a theme like ours, we ought not to be languid and supine, but devoted, eager, consumed with a holy love to God and with a passion for the souls of men. Then should we make progress in the knowledge of the word of God and enter into the words of one of the greatest spiritual athletes that ever lived. This one thing I do, he said, I press toward the goal for the prize of the high calling in Christ Jesus. No one writes like that these days, do they, Barry? No. It's quite uh, articulate, isn't it? Yeah, I, I actually found his book a bit hard to take because yeah. he, he that's the way, he's, all the way through. Yeah, yeah. Sometimes it's good, yeah. sometimes it's <laughs> a bit unnecessary. <laughs> Seems a bit unnecessary. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> One other aspect that was, sort of came to mind in relation to a... Um, running a marathon, is that it is a constant application of doing the same thing. Yeah. And in our modern, a lot of our modern churches, you know, it's, it, it's sort of, um, I think they overlook that and, and they're forever looking for something yeah. new, something different, something um, to make people feel better. Mm. Um, but I, there's something I know that you've talked about a lot in the past, Barry. Of how it's just a constant, that constant plodding on the, on the, on the, the word of God, the, the praying to God, the, you know, um, the doing of God's word in our lives. It's, it's a constant, it's constantly doing those same things. Yeah. All the time, mm. and for <clears throat> for most of us, and I'm no different to a lot of people. I like a bit of a change from time to time, mm. but we're fortunate enough, especially with with all the, the the brothers and that that are speaking. We do get variation, mm. and we do. I mean, one of the reasons we have the uh, we're doing what we're doing tonight. Is because one brother will come up with with something, and then all of a sudden another brother will say, "Yeah, how about such and such and such?" Right. Which has happened tonight, mm. and and it's really good because mm. it it fills out um, our understanding to an even an even greater level. And I think there's hardly a, a Wednesday night when we're doing this when I don't go home quite satisfied right. with okay. what with what's going on. Mm. Barry, can I ask you on, on, on that note, that's a good point, John. Barry, you've, you've been converted, I think, 1960, was it? So 64 years. Um, you're our pastor. Um, 
you know, you're, you're very zealous, you're here, you, you have an excuse that you could sort of bow out a bit because you have to look after Anne, you could sort of say, oh, well, guys, you know, time for you guys just to do more, whatever. But here you are sharing, sharing with us. So um, putting you on the spot here, but <laughs> if, if you had to sort of perhaps nail one thing, the, the one most important thing, which is the antidote to what John's just shared, you know, where the flesh allows us to get, you know, slack and we get sick of doing the same. And, and people do that with church, with Christianity, and they end up leaving the church, leaving their faith. But you haven't, mm. and, you know, you're, you're zealous, you're, you're fervent, you know, you're waiting for the kingdom as much, if not more, than, than you ever were. So, so you are an, an inspiration to us. So mm. could you... Think of, of what, in your experience or, or your knowledge, you would say would be that one most important antidote to that, you know, getting sick of the Lord sort of thing? Yeah, I have thought about it um, because <clears throat> there have been times where, not that anybody in the church would know because, you know, you conceal it, but there, there have been times when I've been... Um, Mainly through discouragement, mm. I think through things not going, mm. you know, how you sort of had hoped and almost the feeling of defeat. Mm. Um, there have been times where I, you know, thought about tossing in the sponge, um, but I, I put it down to the Spirit of God. Um, the, it's, it's a fire. Mm. It's... Um, it, it's um, I, I look in my study, I've got, you know, all the booklets that I've written. I think, really? Did I write all those? You know, and, and I mean, the thought of doing it now, I wouldn't be able to. Um, but it, it was a fire. Mm. It was just a bur uh, It wasn't a question of saying, oh, I better do it, sort of with a heavy heart. I wish I didn't have to. I, I just couldn't help it. Mm. It's, just, it it's, just an inner, it's just an inner fire. It's, it's like Jeremiah Hmm. You know, he got discouraged because of the people and their attitudes and all that. And he thought, I'm not going to talk, I'm not going to speak the word of God anymore. <laughs> but then he said, I couldn't help myself hmm. because of like a fire. Hmm. And so I put it down to, to yeah, you know, I just put it down to the Spirit of God. Um, hmm. He just sort of sets the fire going in my soul hmm. and I can't help myself. Yeah. <laughs> it's, like, it's sort of like an addiction. Hmm. It may not always be there, of course. Um, but God has his time. It'll be there as long as he wants it to be there. Mm. And, and I'll know when it's not there. Mm. And, and that's when I'll retire. Mm. But the spirit, <laughs> of the, the spirit of the prophets is subject to the prophets, right? Yeah. And to be fair, you'd, you'd have to say every Christian who decides to repent and get baptised, they receive the Holy Spirit. They receive, you know, a, a flame in that, in that way. But... There must, like, and, and I'm not saying the Holy Spirit isn't, you know, responsible for our, for our success. Hmm. But like we say about a covenant, it's a two-way deal. That there has to be something that you've chosen to do with that spirit, which means you don't just succumb like others have to getting sick of stuff. Yeah, I think also um, part of the equation is love for the truth yeah yeah um it's just love for the truth and mm. and the the fact that so many so many you know so many well-meaning christians don't see it or don't believe it and you just sort of feel you got to keep teaching it right. you got to yeah. you just got to keep you, it's you can't you can't hide the light mm. you know you've just got to keep sharing it um because you just don't know who's around the corner yeah. that, um, that, that might receive it. Right. Um, I, I imagine prayer would play an important aspect of what you just talked about. Yeah. Personal prayer yeah. to God. Yeah. You know, even the prayer, Lord, I'm tired. <laughs> you talked about Jeremiah. <laughs> yeah, he was, I mean, he was a great man, but he, he got like that. He got mm. despondent. Mm. Um, and... I know for me personally, there are times when oh, I can't be bothered. Mm. Oh, got to go to Sunday school again. Oh, no. <laughs> oh, about yeah. time I gave it away. Yeah. Those thoughts hit me quite often. 
especially as I get into my more twilight years. Mm. Um, but you've got to do something with them. Mm. And, if you, and if you've got the Spirit of God in you, he's going to be saying in one form or another, hey, hang in there. Right. Hey, come on. Mm. Grab yourself, grab your bootstraps and get stuck in again. Mm. And uh, I'm sure every single one of us, at one time or another, well, many times or others, um, that happens. Mm. Because we Can are I quote quite you, Barry? Rigid. Do you mind if I quote you? Yeah. Is that all right? Yeah, good. I remember many years ago you saying to me, I've learnt to despise, you know how we talk about familiarity breeds contempt? Yeah. And that's the problem here. Right. It's a weakness of the flesh. You do something enough, oh, sick of that. It's no different, right, in church. Mm. So this is what happens with Christians. Familiarity breeds contempt. Mm. And I remember you saying to me once years ago, I have, because I, I hate seeing that, you said to me, I have, sort of, I don't know if you use this word, but this is the gist of it. You said, I've trained myself to despise that, mm. to despise how familiarity breeds contempt. Mm. And mm. I think that's, that's one of the keys too, Barry, mm. to what we're talking about, mm. is, is looking at that concept of how doing the same old thing all the time, I get sick of that, nah, 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 nah. If we acknowledge that and despise that, then we're not going to let it sort of have its, have its way so much. Mm. And I don't know how many years ago you told me that, it was a long time ago, but I... But I remember that really stuck with me. And mm. this, is, this is a good thing about mentors, Barry. Yeah. Like the Bible says, teach others that they may teach others also. Mm. And I thought it was worth bringing up for the church and for the, for the recording that principle mm. to learn to train your flesh to despise familiarity breeding contempt. Right. Because mm. if you can do that, mm. then you can do the same thing as many times as you like. Mm. It's not going to breed contempt. So no. um, I remember you telling me that, Barry, one of those <laughs> great, great words of wisdom of many that you've given us over yeah. the years. And, of course, the same principle applies not just in our relationship with the Lord but in, in marriage relationships right. because the same thing, you know, when you're with the same partner for year after year after year, yeah. obviously the honeymoon doesn't last forever. And, and it, it, it so easily happens. You just get so familiar with each other mm. that you start to um, treat it um, with contempt mm. and not, not um, honour it yeah. and, and to end up almost despising it. And that's why people separate. That's yeah. why people divorce. Mm. And, and once you lose that, that respect, well, then you, know, you start saying things to each other that you wouldn't have said on your honeymoon. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. And, it, and it's, so, it's so important to just recognise, and not just in a marriage relationship, in rela relationship with friends, mm -hmm. um, yeah. is to, to recognise it to, um, mm -hmm. when it comes. And, and I mean, you've got to be a bit thick if you don't recognise it. Mm -hmm. You know, you, you've got, I'm sure everybody, if they're honest, would realise, hey, you know, my uh, my attitude. I need to to check this. I need to take authority over this because I know where it can lead. You know, um, so you've just got to keep renewing your your love and your commitment um, to the Lord and to each other. And um, failure to do so ends up in alienation. Mm. 